I'm Daryl Wanzer Serrano. I'm Ariana Ruiz. I'm Renee Rocha. And this is Imagining Latinidades. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our first uh, first recorded episode of 2020. I'm still getting used to writing 2020 on things instead of 2019. Uh, and I'm guessing that half of the people who are listening and most of the people in front of me are getting used to that as well. Uh, That's a nice symmetry. 2020. Uh, it, we're all here today. So I'm uh, I'm Daryl Wanzer Serrano. I had to think about it for a second. I'm Daryl Wanzer Serrano. You are still there. Well, I, can, I, I can verify that is true. I'm looking at you. You are. And you, you are. are. <laughs> I'm Renee Rocha. Ariana here. Didn't the intro say this though? Yeah, the intro said it, but you okay. know. But I, I feel like I, I feel like you know at least fifty percent of the time, all three of us aren't present. Yes. And we all look at Renee. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Renee will be leaving a few minutes early. Uh-huh. So there will be sad trombone. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. He's just scowling. He, it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> Renee, that doesn't translate well into <laughs> podcasting. You have to get Awkward into the silence. <laughs> <laughs> 90% of communication is nonverbal, right? <laughs> Getting into the habit of recording a podcast. I mean, it's been a while since, since we've all sat together to record something. I mean, it was what, like after the last event that we hosted, before the last event that we hosted? I don't remember when the last time all three of us were in the room together for anything this is great yeah Mm -hmm. i think it has been a while you're right so usually we record these episodes like a week or two or you know or four ahead of time uh today we're recording it the day before it's going to air so i'll have fun editing (laughs) it tonight um the beginning of the semester schedules are are always exciting as i'm sure they are for uh for our listeners who are in academia as well um, but we, we need to get this episode done. It's going to be a little shorter episode because it has been such a kind of, uh, you know, messy start to the semester and busy start to this for this, uh, to the semester for all of us. But, uh, but we have our first, our first big, uh, event of the semester this Friday, uh, at the Iowa city public library. It's the, uh, Latina, Latino, Latinx Midwest symposium. Correct. And so we'll be bringing out Lilia Fernandez, Suje Vega, and Teresa Delgadillo as part of um, that symposium. And they'll be joining us to talk about Latinidad in the Midwest. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. You know, this is a this is a great topic, I think, to uh, to address again here at Iowa for a few reasons. One, of course, is that Iowa is kind of, I think, fairly centrally located in the Midwest and has a long history of uh, Latino Latino migration to the state, the going back to the you know really like in, in robust ways going back to the late uh, 19th century and really picking up uh, in the kind of first half of the 20th century. Uh, but also this theme of the Latina Latino Latinx Midwest is one that has been taken up before here at the University of Iowa um, in like formal settings. And so it was my first semester. Yeah, my, my I guess it was my first semester or my first year here uh, in in the 2012-2013 academic year that uh, that three faculty were hosting a Latina Latino Midwest symposium through the Oberman Center. Uh, and that was such a great event. I mean, first it was an it was a it was a wonderful event to have uh, during my first year here in Iowa, especially after having moved directly from Texas. But it was a it was a really important event here at Iowa because you know it really helped to spark the broader uh, to to kind of reignite actually the broader conversations around campus and create demands from the students to have more robust Latino studies programming at the university. So it was it was those student demands that came directly out of that symposium that led to the kind of like opening to propose the Latina Latino Studies minor uh, that is that eventually turned into the Latina Latino Studies program that we have today. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good point, Daryl. I mean, that program was the sort of like, in some ways, beginning of the intellectual energy to get us where we are now, where we have this program that we're building and that we're hosting this uh, Sawyer seminar. One of the other you know, interesting things about this is when we think about like, even going further back in time and how did like the first sort of Latino faculty who are here on campus get here? Like not first ever, but you know, first of this sort of like modern cohort that we have that also comes from a, you know, energy and demands that were centered around the idea of an increasingly diver- diversifying Midwest. Right. So, yeah. you know, 
the you know i came here about 13 years ago on a latino studies cluster hire and that came from an initiative brought by not faculty because faculty didn't exist but by students and staff to the provost under the argument that the you know iowa the midwest was increasingly diversifying with the latino population and that the university needed to sort of like be able to comprehend and and uh you know adapt to that reality and you know the provost at the time was very sympathetic and brought us that uh, latino studies uh, cluster so you know i think that when you think about this theme this theme is really sort of the genesis of latino studies at iowa not just in the direct way you're talking about right now by creating the energy for the program but by even getting the first sort of faculty uh of the modern cohort here on campus yeah you're you're one of those first faculty. I'm, I'm the only Actually, remaining the only one. Remaining, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, but uh, Omar Valer Jimenez, who was one of the people who mm-hmm. organized the first symposium that you're referencing, was uh, came here in that same cluster hire. So yeah, yeah. yeah. The the other people involved in that first uh, symposium, besides Omar, were Santiago Vaquera Vasquez and Claire Fox. And Claire's uh, Claire's still here. She's mm-hmm. uh, the the head of the uh, the English department. And so in many ways, we're thinking about those different trajectories and futures um, that tie not only that symposium to the growth of Latino, Latina studies here on campus, but also to our Mel and Sawyer seminar itself. Um, and we've been really thinking about these things in terms of scale as well. Um, so if we're thinking back to fall semester where we started off with imagining Latinidades in this global and national perspective to kind of get us here to starting off spring semester with a much more uh, localized type of um, symposium specifically on the Midwest um, that will then kind of spear us or move us towards uh, the future of uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx studies as well. Yeah, and one of the things that I really like that's going on here intellectually is, you know, we're thinking about sort of different um, intellectual lenses by which we're looking at Latino studies in the first couple of conferences. And now we're looking at a geography. So we're not looking at a particular sort of like intellectual lens. We're looking at, you know, this, this space. But then we're taking all of those intellectual lenses that we're seeing not applied to a specific geography in the other conferences and now we're sort of like applying it to that context so you can see again one of the really neat things that i think we've done in our programming is create this type of growth right of developing these intellectual trajectories having the application again we'll end with this sort of futurity uh conversation right and so you can really feel that sort of crescendo i think intellectual crescendo of our programming really building as we start the spring semester and I love that point because we're also thinking about it through these different methodological lenses, right? So Lilia Fernandez is someone who's coming from history, Suhe Vega Anthropology, Teresa Delgadillo from English, but they're all thinking about the Midwest in these ways that intersect with one another, um, but that also diverge in really um, interesting ways. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, to, to what extent do you think, uh, or maybe you, maybe you two don't have an answer to this, and it's something that I'm just curious about going into the symposium, uh, to what extent we might see that kind of development uh, or the articulation of an, a Midwestern uh, intellectual perspective being brought to Latino Latino studies uh, in these presentations. Do you know what I mean by that? So like you look at the histories and stuff of the field emerging out of ethnic studies, it happens in a very kind of like region specific sort of way right you get chicano chicano studies developing out on the west you know in the southwest you get uh you get you know chicano studies mexican american studies coming out of texas you get puerto rican studies coming out of new york uh and you know it, it takes some time to really like have the broad the kind of broader latino latina studies perspective sort of emerge to what extent does the kind of midwest midwestern focus of research uh challenge some of those perspectives and methodologies like we've asked this question of people at the round tables like how does latino studies uh provide you with the resources that your disciplinary training doesn't necessarily provide you with, right? The methodological resources and theoretical resources. And I'm wondering what a kind of Midwestern focus, right, in somebody's research provides them uh, and, and, and how that helps them rethink maybe some of the ways that they might have initially come to Latino Latino studies um, 
or you know, or has or has continued to influence how they think about and approach Latino Latina studies, right? Yeah. Which I mean, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. this is a, the the identity portion of this is a question is a conversation that we've had multiple times on the podcast about how the experience of Latinidad in Iowa is different than our experience mm-hmm. of it mm-hmm. in our homes. Yeah, well, I think it's you know we've been able to see if we even just look at the presenters. Uh, you know, they've come from a wide variety of geographic locations, but I think that there's been a theme that when we're talking to individuals who are coming from the Midwest or coming out of, you know, not Texas, not California, um, that the sort of like intellectual questions and the themes that they're asking for are a little bit different. So I'm thinking back to, say, like Gina Perez, who's at Oberlin and, you know, in, in Ohio, as, you know, thinking about basically questions about incorporation, questions about belonging, right? Those are really central to the experience in the Midwest, right? As those sort of like boundaries are just different than they are in areas where the Latino population is just a lot larger. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's sort of like, you know, I'm not sure it's, it's not answering the question of like, what are what are theories or methodologies, but at least like the sort of nature of the research question, I think, um, you know, it, it's different when you're when you're living in this environment and you're just thinking about things that you wouldn't otherwise be thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. No, when you were talking about Gina Perez's work, I was also thinking about um, Francis Aparicio's work and thinking mm-hmm. about those like uh, interconnections and intermixtures of sorts that happen in the Midwest that I think are much more um, visible to a certain extent. And this could be sort of my Californian perspective <laughs> here where uh, I joke with a friend that I used to joke in grad school being like, I knew Puerto Ricans existed, but I'd never met one in person <laughs> till I got to yeah, the Midwest. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that that's one of those things that's really interesting about even just the classroom spaces as well, where you do have all of these different types of Latinidades that are present and that are very much in conversation with each other. And that's something that isn't new. Right. So if we are even thinking about the layout of um, the symposium for Friday, we start off with Lilia Fernandez. That's really setting the stage for theorizing the history of Latinos, Latinas in the Midwest, right? It's something that's not a new phenomenon, but actually a people, a population that have been here um, to mm-hmm. then moving to Suhey's work on borders of, or excuse me, of borders and belonging, addressing the meaning of home and belonging in Latinx Midwestern imagined <laughs> comunidades. And then we're ending with Teresa Delgadillo's environmental sustainability and alternative place times in Midwest Latinx literature. Um, so it really nicely lays out a lot of these conversations that we're having right now, but that we've been having um, thus far throughout uh, the various types of programming that um, the Imagine Latinidades uh, series has been conducting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very well and, said. You know, I don't know enough about the other um, departments in the Midwest to really be able to, to speak about this, but obviously we have some very old departments, uh, like Minnesota, we have some very established departments, like Illinois. Uh, and I don't really know enough about sort of like the intellectual branding of these different of, of these different units, but I think that sort of like one exercise that we may want to undertake as we end this year is really thinking about sort of what the intellectual branding of us as a unit is. I mean, we're very different. Like we're, you know, completely different fields. Um, you know, we approach things very differently, but I think that there are probably some sort of like very broad common threads we could probably do to, um, to, to tie all of this intellectual energy together and just sitting around and like thinking about like how we might articulate that, uh, how we might articulate that and sort of use it as a center, you know, again, sort of central, uh, identifying branding of our program, I think would be really useful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like thinking in terms of like uh, uh, making the um, uh, some connection to the Midwest a focus of of our program. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, or you know, if we're all sort of really centered around issues of belonging or issues of incorporation or you know wh- wh- whatever those might be, right? And being able to say like these, you know, that's really sort of like at the central intellectual heart of Latino studies at Iowa, you know. Ah, I can tell you, we, we've done a lot of, uh, it's called uh growth, missions, Daryl. mission statement. <laughs> 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 well, here, here, here in Iowa, like over the last, uh, what, two months, we've been engaged, all the departments have been engaged in a lot of mission statement and vision sort of work as the college is set to revise its mission and strategic plan and the university is as well. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, these, these are kind of core questions that speak to like, who we are, what we want to do, and what our goals are as a as a program. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as we get more faculty, uh, which hopefully keeps happening over the over the coming years, right? That's definitely a big conversation to have. Yeah. Cool. Although I'm slightly depressed now that we've uh, pointed out how much mission statements have creeped into my mind. 
<laughs> yeah, you've, 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 you've been uh, you've been interpolated as a subject of the modern uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, neoliberal that's, university, Renee. Yeah, that's depressing. Okay, <laughs> don't don't say neoliberal. You know, word, you're gonna have like you're gonna have like dreams about neoliberalism. Yeah, we can't. We can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so you may not know this, but we just took a quick break uh, because uh, Renee had to leave. And so it's just me and Ariana. And we were talking off mic while we were away. Again, it doesn't seem like we were away because I just edited it to make it seem like it was just a, you know, a quick breather. I think the smooth transition will be the sad trombones and oh, then yeah. just kind of be like, and now we're back. Yeah, sure. That yeah, was it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, we're, you know, we're like, oh, that, that was a that was a tight 15. Like we, we, we kind of talked about the main thing that we really had prepared to talk about for, uh, for, for this week, but then got to talking and wanted to have a, a quick conversation because over, uh, over the break, since Adriana and I are just now getting a chance to catch up, we haven't really like caught up. Caught Today up. is the first time we see each other in 2020. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. This, it's been a while. This is like the longest we haven't seen each other because of all the prep work we've been doing yeah. on the Sawyer Seminar stuff uh, in like... I think when we all came <laughs> in for our just general meeting was the first time in a long time that all three of us, as you mentioned at the beginning, were together yeah. in, in the space. And so it's it's kind of like, oh, look, we're all together again. <laughs> we've missed e- each other. Yeah, it's uh it's it's it yes, it's it's the 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 rhythms of the of, of academic life especially while planning uh stuff is is weird and that's part of why it's, it's like I think maybe that's part of why the semester everything has kind of felt thrown off for me in 2020 because we haven't had like our regular meetings and stuff. But I but I really want to ask you because I know that over break you got to go spend some time in archives and we we started talking about it just briefly and wanted to have the conversation uh, here on recording and maybe we'll use all of this maybe we won't we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, but the question is so like I, I do you know I, I do archival work for for my research and I I feel like there are. Uh, and just knowing other people who do archival work, especially historians, I feel like there's kind of two broad schools of thought about uh, how much people are willing to talk about the archival work th- that they're doing. Mm. So like school A uh, it, are the people who are like, yeah, I do archival work and let me tell you about what I found. And they'll, they want to do that as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's group B who's like, mm, I'm going to wait till it shows up in print because I'm worried about people like getting the scoop on me or whatever. Mm. Um, I fall into group A um, in part because I don't, I don't know. I, cause just cause I get, just cause I can't control my excitement about like archival finds, like, like the last big, you know, lengthy archival trip I did. I, 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 I found the, the kind of like what to me is this mythical document that was to see it and it, to see it, hold it in my hands mm-hmm. was something special of mm-hmm. uh, the Puerto Rican House of Delegates when they sent their kind of memo to Congress, uh, uh, basically a breakup letter saying they didn't want U.S. citizenship. Mm. Um, really famous uh, memo, uh, one that like everyone who writes about Puerto Rican history talks about. Uh, but I never actually like seen the text of it mm-hmm. to like hold mm-hmm. it in my hand. It's like, oh my god, this is so amazing! And to read it and to talk to people about like how just like uh, like how sassy this letter is, mm-hmm. right? It's just like you know, it's like oh, you know, U.S. citizenship is so wonderful for you Americans, but not for us, right? Uh, like, you know, so, so it's like you know, it's like a, it's, a, it's not you, it's us. Anyway, so like I, I, I just want I want to hear about your archival trip, but at the same time, like I respect uh, and acknowledge that you may not want to talk about it yeah I mean I think for me it's I'll say can't be but can't be because I'm still thinking through the connections that it was so so this is um Michelle Cerros who was um a Chicana writer um out of the well at the time that she was writing two of the texts that I'm looking at um out of the Southern California area. She grew up in Oxnard area. Um, and so her collection is now at um, CSU Channel Island. Um, and so they just got the collection, what was it, a year ago or so? Oh, wow. um, so they haven't actually processed anything. Everything is still in boxes. And they were gracious, 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 gracious enough to allow me to go kind of just 
look at stuff. That's amazing. Right? So it's it was wonderful. It was awesome. And that experience that you're talking about, it's so interesting yeah. to think about that sort of affective response to a document um, that you're holding in your hand, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can maybe see copies of it online or are able to find some of the text here and there, but there's something to like actually holding um, that piece of paper that's, that's so interesting to me because I had that same feeling and reaction yeah. looking through things and seeing like, oh my gosh, this, this connection that I always assumed was there, but didn't have any evidence that was there. And now I'm holding this paper, this flyer that shows that these two people were, you know, um, on the same like poetry circuit in the nineties in Los Angeles, like things like yeah. that. Right. Oh, they got um, flyers in that collection. Yeah. It's such an oh, that's really so interesting connection, um, or collection rather, because there's just so many stories that can be told from it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why I'm like, I guess I'm kind of camp. B or in the middle of A and B just sure. because I've gotten the opportunity to look at these materials and there's things that are connecting, but I still need to, now that I'm back in Iowa city, it's like, okay, now what do I make of everything that I saw? What are yeah. those threads um, that at that particular moment I was making and just like seeing things. Now I can kind of step back and see like, what are the, what are the threads that I do want to pull out? Mm-hmm. Um, that I think I would like to say a little bit more about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, Oh, it was, it was great. I mean, it was one of those where you could stay there for days and days and days to really be able to, um, appreciate all of the different pieces. Yeah. Um, it's also, I think for me, it was very, um, emotional, I guess at times, just because this is a writer that very much impacted me and my scholarship. Um, and so to be able to look at journals or even, um, planners where she'd have certain things noted on there or shows that she was going to go see things of that nature where it was just like, Oh my gosh, this, it just, um, it adds a different dimension to, to the work. What a rich sounding collection that is. That's so amazing. It's awesome. It's awesome. And she's someone who we're talking about journals from her in primary school. Right. So like in terms of seeing her evolution, even as a writer, right. Like to see just, she was always a writer and the, the stories that she would write as a little kid and how, um, there's this great, great, um, college notebooks that she has. And so you see this sort of um, introduction to Chicano and Latino literature as well and how that starts to influence her journal entries or just her general thinking and sort of these side notes that she'll have. So all of these different things that just came together in really beautiful ways um, and that I just found absolutely fascinating. Um, And like I said, right now I'm like, so many wonderful things, which one to pick or which one to talk about? Um, and so I'm right now it's sort of like the processing. I don't know if that's sort of a stage that you kind of go through. Absolutely. Yeah. As you're looking at the archives where you're like, okay, I just saw all of this awesome and amazing stuff. Now what? Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. Well, yeah, yeah. And all that, all that amazing stuff is, is, I mean, certainly it's going to go into your book, but then there's also like little Mm -hmm. side projects that are going to come out of it. I'm sure. Right. How many many days did you get to spend there? So this was my second time there. Um, So during the summer, which I feel like maybe in one of the first podcasts, we talked about what we did in the summer or something like that. And I might've been like, I was at an archive. (laughs) So I'm like, I, I take advantage of the fact that I am from the Los Angeles area that during breaks, it's like, all right, I can say hi to my family and then go do work. Yeah, yeah. Um, So I was there for about a week. Yeah. 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 It sounds like you'll go back again. Oh yeah, no. And like I said, they're just wonderful, like shout out to the librarians and archivists at Channel Islands because they're they've just been really really great um, about just helping me along the way as well and um, really willing to work with me and my schedule as well um, knowing that our academic calendar is a little bit different than theirs yeah. so so yeah it's been it's been awesome cool yeah cool that's like way more productive than I was over break <laughs> there were believe me there were periods of like today is a PJ day <laughs> and I will sit on the couch. And hang out with family. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I'm like, now I'm back. All right. Time to get stuff done. We are back. And we're, and we're, we're, and we're back like at like full speed with having our first event 
uh, you know, this is our second week of the semester here at Iowa. And our first event is this Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just wild to me. Yeah. I will say, like, I'm very, very excited to be back. These This symposium that we are having and the various things that we have planned out for the semester, I'm like, th- this is a good kind of busy, right? Oh, yeah, like absolutely. Like the kind where you're like, yes, I'm glad to be back and to talk to really interesting people and learn lots of interesting and um, awesome things. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I am super, super excited about this particular symposium just because like I've had for, you know, since I moved here, I guess like a couple of different, and I'm sure in part because of that, uh, that, that symposium that, uh, that Claire and Omar and Santiago uh, spearheaded, I've been wanting to do a kind of Midwest centered project. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, third in my slate of projects right now, just because the other ones have some work done on them and this Mm -hmm. one doesn't. Um, But definitely like something that I want to be doing in the, you know, in the, in the, in the nearish future, like maybe after going up for full is, is go kind of, you know, full bore into a a kind of Midwest uh, focused project. Uh, Just thinking about like representations of, uh, Latino folks in the Midwest, you know, maybe even focusing just specifically on Iowa. Um, it's th- something that I think would be pretty exciting or thinking about like, like student activism at the university of Iowa, which is, um, which is a history that's like, you know, known, uh, by, by some folks on campus. Um, and it's certainly like recorded well by like the student newspaper and the, uh, the, 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 the university yearbook. Um, but, you know, is one that uh, that that might be kind of fun to really like do in a in a full on you know give it the full scholarly treatment of like okay like what is the what is like the full in depth you know complete history of Latinos at the University of Iowa and how does it go through how how do they go through this these phases of activism and visibility and invisibility on campus another thing that I've been thinking about yeah and I think that. You know, to kind of go back to some of the comments that we were um, bringing up earlier in the podcast, thinking about that rich history that Iowa does have, that the Midwest does have when it comes to, you know, the experience, the lives of Latinos, Latinas, Latinx folk in in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think as an assistant professor coming into Iowa, teaching courses in Latino, Latina, Latinx studies, um, for me, that was definitely a part of of what I needed to teach myself, right, um, is really thinking about, well, what are the stories that are here? I think at the University of Iowa, we're very fortunate in that we have, um, for example, the Mujeres Latinas project yeah. that is recovering and documenting and archiving all of these different experiences and stories um, and really is beneficial to, and this kind of goes to our roundtable conversations of like, it's beneficial to our Latino, Latina, Latinx students, but also to students that may not identify as such, yeah. right. To really think about those histories and whose stories we center. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that would be a wonderful project, right? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, so again, you know, this Friday, uh, uh, the Latina, Latino, Latinx Midwest Symposium uh, will be at the Iowa City Public Library starting at, uh, well, Coffee and Pastries at 9 a.m. Uh, welcome and remarks kick off at about 9.30. Uh, this will be uh, live streamed, I think, through Facebook um, is, is what we did the last one on. Um, and I think if you tried to watch the live stream through Facebook last time uh, and found it hard to hear, uh, I think we are resolving that. I, I, I should have probably in the mailroom right now a new microphone for, um, for picking up the audio for that live stream. Um, and then, uh, oh, and I guess the, the, the one other thing I wanted to say was, uh, I know we've been promising the videos, uh, for, for our events. Those are, those should be going online soon, uh, from the, all of the fall events. Um, uh, stay tuned for more information on that. I I heard from the videographer and I think they're close to being done. There's a couple of things we'll need to do before we get those online, but, um, but, but look for those coming soon. And we'll of course publicize that in our social media channels and on this podcast as well. So anything else? Um, I think that is it. Awesome. Well, uh, all of that said, 
Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on Twitter. We're at Imagining Lat uh, for the podcast. Uh, also, you can shoot us an email at podcast at imaginingLatinidades.com. Um, additionally, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast and get your friends to subscribe to it as well. Uh, and if y'all are so inclined, uh, leave us five stars on Apple podcasts, uh, or leave us a review wherever you leave reviews for things like this. Um, and that helps us, uh, that helps us kind of get word out and get exposed to more people, um, as well. So all that said, thank you for listening. Uh, please check the show notes, uh, which will be minimal this week, but they will be there, uh, for links related to the people who, uh, who we talked about who are going to be coming to campus this week, as well as the events, uh, that, uh, that we've talked about. So thanks. Th- yeah. Thank you. Thank you.